And I am a board member at Toronto Psychedelic Community. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. It's wonderful to see everyone here uh, showing how strong community can be and what that means when we have a conversation about access to psychedelic assisted therapy, equitable access for psychedelic therapy. Our first panel this evening uh, is going to be uh, with patient advocates, uh, followed by a quick break, and then after that we're going to have a panel with the lawyers who will be discussing the Charter Challenge. Uh, in greater detail. So just a quick rundown of, of uh, the next hour and a half. We'll be about 30, 35 minutes up here. If you have questions, I hope everyone uh, has access to the link uh, in the email that was provided last night. If you don't have access, please see Joe uh, in the pink shirt right there, the beautiful beard. He'll be able to connect you with that, uh, that application. And please feel free to start populating questions. Uh, I'm going to be moderating the first panel this evening, and so I will certainly be looking to the audience for participation and support, and I'm sure that everyone will have some fantastic questions. So um, without further ado, again, my name is Zero Tashinato. Uh, I'm also Executive Director of Oral Arts Project Canada, a charity that connects veterans with psychedelic assisted therapy. Uh, so it's my great pleasure and honor to be here tonight to, uh, to help moderate a discussion about stories. Stories are what brings us together uh, as a community. They can help dispel complexities like legal challenges that we're going to learn more about tonight. Uh, and stories help bring communities together and really catalyze our passion and shared interest and our common cause around the topics and concerns that are closest and nearest our hearts. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into quick you know, introductions with all of our uh, wonderful participants and, and, uh, and panel members. I'm going to take a seat right here and just pass it over. Uh, we have uh, uh, Scott Allgood, Steve Allgood, I'm so sorry. I uh, we have Steve Allgood, uh, we have Allison Murden, and we have Scott Atkinson, uh, who will be sharing their stories about how they have access psychedelics, how they've worked with psychedelics, and I'm just going to start off with the first question, just a quick introduction about yourselves and your initial journey to psychedelics uh, and how that kind of came to be, so over to you. Um, hey everyone, my name is Steve Allgood, and four and a half years ago, two days before my wedding, I was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer and sent home to die with no treatment options available. Um, Hearing that news sent me into a severe depression and filled my life with anxiety. And uh, my wife had got pre uh, pregnant a few weeks later, or a few months later. Um, I was trying my best to tell myself that I would be uh, one of these people that you hear about that beat terminal cancer, but my my hope quickly uh, started to fade away as uh, I was losing my my movements in my arms and uh, legs and uh, being disabled by severe headaches daily. Um, I had found relief with high dose cannabis oil, but a negative side effect of that is it amplified the anxiety and depression at times. Um, I became suicidal to where it's not that I wanted to die, but I didn't want to continue living life the way I was. And through my research with THC, I became aware of the possible benefits of psilocybin and how it can regrow neurons and rewire your brain. And also benefits of other psychedelic drugs like MDMA and um, LSD. Um, the mushrooms that I obtained illegally, unfortunately, because I was desperate, really changed my, my way of life. It, took me out of the victim mentality and showed me that I was still able to live life with such a, a life-changing disease that was uh, taking over. Um, I have had great benefits with psychedelics and want to tell my story as best I can. I've had MDMA really changed my life and really seen me see, really showed me um, some crazy things. It kind of showed me a future vision of my life and what to live for. Um, but with psychedelics still being illegal, I was always worried that I would be sent to jail or my kids may possibly be taken away from me. And that is what led me to get seek out the Section 56 exemption 
and be legally allowed to take psilocybin mushrooms um, in a therapeutic setting. And that really helped my life as it turned around the way I view past traumas and um, see the depression that was happening to me. I can learn from those issues and put them to use and be fully present with my family nowadays. Thank you, Steve. Allison. Hi, everybody. My name is Allison Murden. Like Burden, but I'm no trouble at all. I have been on this journey for a hundred years, many of you might know. And literally, my journey started with a lot of pharmaceuticals many years ago in the 1990s. It brought me to find out that not only cannabis was good medicine, but so are psychedelics. Lots more to come, you guys. Alice and Merton, check me out. www.alicemerton.ca in Canada or .com if you're worldly like me. <laughs> Thank you, Allison and uh, Scott. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm, my name is Scott Atkinson. I was 25 years in the Canadian military. Uh, three deployments, Bosnia, Afghanistan, twice. My first tour in Bosnia, I didn't realize I was broken when I came home. I just kept going. I started drinking heavily. That's what I knew. And that's how I did it. I later, after moving around, whatever, with the military, I ended up in Afghanistan for the, well, the first time. I fell about 60 feet during a combat operation, and I broke, I broke my foot, and I hurt my back, anyway. Then went on to my second tour. I, sorry, let's go back. Came home, I came home from my first tour. I was posted to the United States a week later. Got to the United States, of course, I'm all done. I've been over in Afghanistan for seven months. First week, I wipe out my ATV, brand new ATV against a tree, broken back, shattered arm, messed up my head pretty bad. So that was the start of my opioid addiction, to go with the alcohol. Kept going in the military for a couple more years, and it wasn't, I was drinking heavy, I wasn't, I, I, my family was faltering horribly, my poor children were seeing me every day with the anger, the alcohol, the pills, I, I didn't realize it, they figured it out in rehab, I was taking upwards of 15,000 milligrams of codeine a day, plus morphine, plus perks, plus usually a bottle of Jack Daniels a day, that was my life, and that was my kid's life, that was my wife's life. It was horrible. After rehab, I found cannabis, which I found to be very, very helpful to me. I was able to get off all the mental health meds, and then I was introduced to, to psychedelics. I was microdosing for the first little bit, and then ended up, I got to go to Jamaica on a retreat, which changed a lot for me. I was able to get on a good program after that with ketamine, then I got my, my section 56 after that, and it has been a change in life. Uh, I've gone from almost 300 pounds down to 200 for the first time since I was about six years old. I'm a big guy, I was a rugby player. <laughs> um, don't take this the bad way, don't take this the wrong way, it's good. After 24 years, not, after psychedelics, 24 years, my wife and I went, we had to, you know what, we had to learn our own lessons. Uh, this happened about six months ago. So, you know what, it's all part of life. It's all part of the journey with, with doing this, with being part of it, with being part of myself, her being part of herself as well. And when I got the, the, the Section 56, I was lucky. I, 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 had a, I had a person who could readily have it for me. If I didn't have that one person, I, I, I wouldn't have known where to go. I was in the military for 25 years. I didn't smoke weed. I didn't do mushrooms. I didn't do anything like that. I was a good boy. And yeah, I was, I was left to be on my own with it. And it was, had I not had that person there, 
it, it would have been it would have been useless for me, really, to be honest. And I wouldn't have been able to get to that to the point. I wouldn't have been able to get to the point where I am now today, sitting here speaking for with everybody here, and helping this the mental health and the pain that everybody has in this country be taken away in such an easy way if we can only work with, if the government can only work with us to get this done. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to say, I didn't realize we were getting all detailed, so I wanted people to know my backstory. I actually, a number of years ago, in the early 1990s, was diagnosed with chronic progressive or primary progressive multiple sclerosis, and soon afterwards, a violent pain in my face called trigeminal neuralgia, and it turned it out many years, well not many years, but just a few years, within a few years from that, my pain in my face and head went bilateral, so I now have it 24 hours a day, constantly somewhere in my face and head. But my journey, I wanted to say, with psychedelics especially, started over 30 years ago. And I couldn't tell the country or the world about using psychedelics before we actually legalized cannabis in the country. Because they didn't want people to think I was having problems with different substances. So what I did, my history is, 32 pills a day, 2,000 milligrams of morphine a day, heroin and then cocaine, every day for 18 years. And then finally 18 years came up and I said, I am done. I was fighting during that time to legalize cannabis so that I could at least keep my 32 pills a day down because it was a really hard time doing that. And again, when I started using psychedelics, I actually was introduced to psilocybin through tea, through psilocybin tea, mushroom tea, through a party, through, pardon me, a friend that had a party and I had this violent pain at the party and I couldn't get on top of it. And all of a sudden I had a mushroom tea in front of me and within 10 minutes I was talking and laughing with everybody else not realizing I had no pain in my face. Now, after 30 years of doing this, my partner Gary Lynch and I have realized in Gary's time me, it takes pretty much about six and a half minutes when I eat a handful of magic mushrooms. I take roughly five grams of magic mushrooms a day which media have told me, again, is 10 times the hero's dose. Who would have known what the hero's dose was? <laughs> so anyway, I take 50 grams a day is what I'm authorized through my doctors, and I apply for a Section 56 through my lawyer, Paul Lewin, who is standing and going to be speaking tonight. But it was 16 months ago exactly today that I applied for that uh, license or Section 56. And just to let you know, cannabis, I've had a Section 56 for cannabis since 1994, and that was long before the country legalized cannabis. So my partner Gary and I spent in the last 30 years trying to educate everybody traveling all over Canada and the world, trying to get this finally realized and regulated, including lobbying the government on a regular basis, which I still do today. So I want people to understand that my Section 56 is unanswered, and I have a violent pain in my face and head, so I can't even imagine what somebody with less pain and fewer health issues than I am goes to, especially through end-of-life care. And Bruce Tobin, the fellow who started the end-of-life care project here in Canada, pardon me, is from originally British Columbia, and phoned me in 2017 when I became the first authorized patient in the world to consume psilocybin as medicine. And Bruce Tobin said to me, why don't we do this together and we'll all take them down, we'll teach the world together. And I said, no, you know what though, Bruce, end of life care is so much more important. People like me are gonna be here, we're not going anywhere. I have excruciating pain, but I can take mushrooms five grams at a time and six and a half minutes later, I have magic up and running. So I will tell you if that's what that does for me again, I can't even imagine what it would do for other people. So again, David, thank you for giving me that minute. I just wanted you all to know, check out my website for more details because I just don't stop. I am everywhere, trust me.
Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Steve. Clearly, they're not just advocates, but they're trailblazers. They're leaders in the space. They're sharing their stories and sharing them uh, with us tonight, and I really appreciate this. And one of the questions I want to ask as a follow-up, um, and it's to all three of you, is, you know, can you discuss the impact in a bit more detail uh, that psychedelics has had on your quality of life? Uh, and can you also share a bit more about the challenges you've experienced in terms of obtaining that access and how difficult or what that process might have looked like for each of you in a bit more detail? Steve? Um, so yeah, psychedelics have, have been what gave me my life back. Um, like if you can ask my wife later tonight, like for the first year and a half after I was diagnosed, like I had hope that I was going to survive, but at the same time I was counting down the clock to my death and not being a very spiritual or religious person, that was extremely terrifying and not knowing what was to come and fearing that I was going to lose my, or that my family was going to live and not have a, a dad and I, seeing my son and daughter every day just it was uh, devastating, but since I would say the, the visions that I've had on psychedelics, it's allowed me to be the most present father I can be with my children and has eliminated my fear of death, changed my beliefs on what death is for humans in a sense. Um, and yeah, I kind of forget your question. <laughs> that's, that's a beautiful answer, I'm also a father. And Broken my heart for. I'll come back to the challenges around access, but Allison, can you? Oh, Scott, may you uh, tell me a bit more about what impact psychedelics has had in your first, life? First of all, I can say that I got to say as you said, it's changed, it's changed my life. Like it's um, as I mentioned I, a couple of years ago, I was close to 300 pounds. Um, now here I am, 200. I was a rugby player, I was a drinker, I fought, I did everything. I am now going to get my yoga instructor to work with other veterans. <laughs> um, I'm, very, I'm very spiritual now. I'm, I find myself in a different light at times. Um, my, even my wife, who, who with the separation, is noticing a, a difference in me now. And it's, it's gotten me to a beautiful spot now. Unfortunately, it's not the map we want to take, but it's gotten me to a beautiful spot in life. And I'm loving myself more. I'm loving others more. I'm not grinding. And this isn't to put, this isn't, I don't, this isn't for anything, but my go-to used to be the bottle. And since my wife and I separated, I've had one drink. That's because it was Christmas with everybody else. And that's what the, that's what the stuff like this has gotten me. To be able to be part of life again, be part of my own life, to be able to walk down the street and go, hey, I don't care anymore. You know, it's how I am. And you know what, I say it a lot right now, but life is life. And we just have to make the right decisions to carry on and love and laugh. Yes. Thank you. Allison. On my own. Hey, thanks. <laughs> so, my psilocybin journey, again, has been going on for decades, everybody. But as you all know, I mentioned earlier, it's been 16 months to the day today that I've been waiting for the federal government of Canada to answer my plea to please allow me to use psilocybin legally. Really and truly, I don't care, because for 30 years I consumed it and I didn't. But I want the world to know that because of the amounts I'm using, and again, I'm five grams every two hours. So I know that sounds like a lot to people, but for someone like me who suffers from the worst pain known to medicine, and now all of a sudden it's gone, they just realized. Yay! <laughs> so that's how fast the mushrooms work for me. But I just wanted one to know again, my psychedelic journey, pardon me, will not end 
until all, all drugs really are legalized and regulated because that's what I've been fighting for for 30 years. I'm also a retired corrections officer and I spoke in the U.S. or for a U.S. group, pardon me, called LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And they found me in Ottawa, you know, trying to get the federal government then to listen to us to legalize and regulate all drugs because at that time, doctors were giving me heroin and cocaine and I was thinking it didn't make sense that I had to fight for things like cannabis and heroin and cocaine were already legal through my local hospital, through my doctors. So ultimately, again, my psychedelic journey will not end until every single drug in this country is legalized, regulated, taken off the street, out of the hands of criminals, once and for all, and away from our children. Thank you. To switch gears a bit and start talking about the, the legal challenge, I, what does the legal challenge mean to you? I'm going to start with Scott here. You know, it means, it means more, more, it means we can start to eradicate some of the mental health problems with, some, with people, not only in Canada, but all over the world. We were, we were almost a starting point with cannabis in the last few years. Uh, why aren't we to start with this? Why aren't we doing it easier for people for mental health? You know, they, they just did it in Vancouver and with, they legalized all the drugs there. And mushrooms could have been, I, I think psychedelics could have been a big part of that. And, but the government held back on it. And I think this is a huge part of where we're going with it. Is, Getting people normal again. Living again. Sorry. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. And Allison. Uh, well, again, again, many people might know of the challenge that is in the federal courts today with this end of life care issue. I personally am not involved. I am in my own fight. I've been my own, on my own journey for decades. But I am really sad to see that the country and the federal government, the country is paying attention, everybody here is interested, but the federal government has yet to understand that this is a choice for patients. We don't want pills. We're asking for something other than pills, and that's all it is. And we don't want the government to give us excuses, because in the United Nations has nothing to do with this. So we want Canada to make a decision. And again, that's why I fully support the Charter Challenge right now that's out for psilocybin as medicine. And please, if you do, we will all do it together. Um, for me, it's, it's something I get angry over because when I was sick, I was getting told I should go into hospice or palliative care, and in this country, you're, you can get maids, medical assisted and dying within three days approved, I believe, and doctors not wanting to help me. I, had, I didn't even know about this Section 56. Um, it was just out of desperation that I reached out to a website um, from this clinic in Calgary that uh, offers psilocybin and ketamine journeys that they they are the ones that did the process for me as as a person with brain cancer and has had has had radiation to my brain um, thinking and focusing is something I <laughs> struggle with at times so like if you have a section 56 exemption all the little everything you have to go over and fill out it's it's very hard for me to focus and do that um, where this company did that for me. So I don't think people should be struggling and not know about this when they can go and get themselves killed within a week's time if they wanted. But a lot of people don't even know about Section 56 and all of the, the aspects that come with it. And then applying for it, I had to like retell my entire story and say why I'm a good fit for, for psilocybin therapy. Um, and like writing out an essay of all the trauma and depression that I go th went through, it was bringing all that back to light. It took me like I think a month and a half or two months just to send that email. Um, and I don't think that should be something that people who are struggling need to face. I, 
I'd just like to take a moment. If anyone has questions, I'd just like to remind you to please visit the, uh, the link that was in the email last night. Uh, if you don't have that link, just do get a hold of Joe right here. He'll be able to. Yeah. If, if, if you don't have the link, just ask your neighbor. Somebody's got an email from me yesterday that's got the link, or um, you can send an email to joe at toronto-psychedelic.ca and, um, and we'll get it up here. But I do encourage everyone to think some questions through because that this is a rare opportunity where we are sitting down with advocates, with trailblazers, with leaders within the space. Um, one of my questions here is, you know, we as a community, we. we we come together, we talk about access, we talk about the barriers, we talk about the opportunities. Uh, but, you know, building off your own experiences, you know, what sort of counsel would you provide the community here tonight about what we can do as a community coming together uh, to really help make a difference and advance the common cause I think a lot of us share and uh, might believe in uh, and might be curious to learn more about? Uh, Scott, what sort of steps would, would you suggest here? First, ask the question. Ask questions. Questions are the best thing. Um, don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Um, you know, it's this is something that needs to be done. We need to step into it. We need to, as many people as we can to step into it. And the more, the better. The faster this is going to happen. Thank you, Allison. Well, I will say, I'm an old pro at things like this, and I will say, lobby the heck out of your MPs and federal government, everybody. Tell them that this is necessary, not only for people who are finally ending their life at some point and choose this as medicine, but for those of us who are still surviving. Steve. Um, I don't know too much of what I'm should say here, but uh, I would just say share these stories tonight that you hear. Um, next time you're at your doctor's office or have an appointment, maybe mention psychedelics as medicine and see what kind of questions they have or what they have to say about it and just get more people thinking about it and all the benefits that it has helped us three up here tonight. Thank you. And thank you. I'm seeing questions coming in, so if you're able to share that link with a neighbor, please do. Um, question from the crowd for the for the veteran. How was the experience of ketamine treatment? Is there room for improvement? In the therapy itself, I don't believe so. I, I, as I've said before, it's a dark. It's a dark. Ketamine is a dark spot. But I think. From what I've seen from the companies, from the groups that are doing ketamine now, the biggest thing is what happens after. There, it, it seems with most of these companies that are doing it, the ketamine, I myself, I did six and then I did two with a, with a group, and it just stops. There's no information after. You don't know what to do. You're unpacking a lot in your brain. <clears throat> Pardon me, you're unpacking a lot in your brain, but you don't know where to go with it. You don't know what to do with it. And I found that for myself and other veterans that had done it to be the hardest part. I was holding groups myself, just with the five or six of us from that area that had done it, to just sit and talk, talk it out, because that's, that was, sorry, that was my down, that was my biggest downside to it, to the ketamine, was that it was nothing after. There has to be the follow-up treatments. How is it yeah, from that? Actually, again, I might differ. So, I had emergency throat surgery about three years ago, and doctors gave me ketamine, actually, for the pain in my face. With five hours of pain relief after the surgery, I am one of the biggest proponents for ketamine for pain. Secondly, I had surgery again recently, and what I asked for when I had a meeting with all of my medical team was not pharmaceuticals, but again, ketamine for an anesthetic. So ketamine, again, kept me pain-free, this time for three hours after the surgery, because I assume they probably didn't use as much. But again, a proponent for ketamine, a proponent for all drugs. As I said, I've been there, I've done them, I know exactly how they all feel. 
I'm not suggesting anybody go and do what I do, but if again, in your health journeys, you choose something like this as medicine, then please again, as Scott and Steve have said, and even David, you know, again, all of us have different journeys, and I just want people to know, battling my health issues, ketamine was a definite plus, so. Steve, there's a question for you. Could you please talk a bit about your initial psilocybin journey? Uh, there's uh, someone in the audience who's asking for a family member battling advanced cancer. Um, so yeah, um, my first journey, I believe, um, after I was diagnosed was November or December of 2019. Um, I had gotten good news that my tumor had shrunk a bit, but I was still physically feeling the same symptoms and yeah, my mental health was just declining. I took, I believe it was five, maybe six grams of mushrooms just in my bedroom and had a total life-changing experience. Like I just seen, I just seen like the world and people in a total different way and how, how I was going about life and living my life for the past so many years um, and just raise my level of consciousness and and like I said, I, it feels like the mushrooms told me like you can lay here and tell yourself you're a cancer victim that can't do anything like the doctor said or you can get up and try to live life in a disabled way. Steve, there's a follow-up question as well. Did you find that lasting effects from a single macro psilocybin dose uh, in path or have you found that smaller regular doses uh, have helped? That's a good question. Um, yeah, so the the macro dose, it'll, it was again life-changing, but then life continues and things continue to happen and that's where I'm an advocate for the, the therapy because you learn how to integrate what you what came up and put it into your life and learn from it and change your ways to where before, like yeah, I would I would be microdosing for weeks after, and then like a month or two after, I think is the second time I took it, um, just because like yeah, like I said, my my physical health wasn't changing, and issues that came up, like I could I would heal from childhood trauma issues or effects in my life, but those things that were still happening around me weren't changing, and I didn't know how to deal with that, so. That's where I'm a very big advocate for uh, doing a, a session with a therapist and doing the integration work after. Oh, that's great. And uh, how long, yeah, and this, you know, I know Alice, you talked a little bit about this in terms of uh, the rapidity with which psychedelics can help you physically right away, but, you know, perhaps Scott and Steve, you know, what is, how long did it take to, for you to realize some of the benefits uh, you know, of course, with some of the assisted therapy and other therapeutic supports. But what was that sort of time frame like? For me, it was immediately. I was starting to notice things right away. Uh, especially when I would go into the, the macro doses, the bigger ones, I'd come out of it like, wow. <laughs> and I was noticing just even how I was acting and just how, how I was dealing with things. Here's a big one for me. A lot of people with with PTSD with issues, <laughs> a lot of veterans who drive like idiots at times. I'm not, I, I, I'm not always one of the worst, and just angry all the time. Now my truck doesn't go over 85 kilometers an hour. I just sit back. I don't care anymore. I got nothing to hurry for, and it's all from when I started using psychedelics. My life slowed down, and it's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would say immediately too, like that was another uh, life-changing moment, like it just made me full of gratitude and grateful just to be able to go outside and like look at a tree and the leaves were blowing, like it really connected me with nature. Um, and I remember, I don't know if it was the day of the trip or like a day or two later, but I remember having a shower and just being so thankful that I'm standing under hot water and like... It was just like one of the greatest feelings and moments of my life, which everyone takes a shower daily and doesn't probably think that way, but like 
I just was fascinated about being alive in this time where I'm lucky enough to have a warm shower <laughs> rather than sit in my bed and cry. It's beautiful. Um, this is for all, all three of you, I, and I think you know, this touches on the, the therapeutic supports and the community-based, the peer-based supports that you've touched on. So are there any support groups for patients? Uh, are there any group integration initiatives for people who have gone through psychedelic therapy? Uh, and and how, to, how, how have you found those sort of services, or how have you created those sort of circles of support to help your healing process? Well, for me, like I said, I, I created one. I have the, I have, uh, the, the luck that I, I, I run a veterans cannabis clinic, and I have the chance to be, have the vets there that I can sit down with them and kind of do our own integration after. As I said, with some of the stuff, it, it just stopped. Uh, be, and I created one for everybody, just to come and talk. And, and usually it isn't even about, one of those integrations is not even about the psychedelics. It's just sitting about talking and just getting things out. And I, I did find in one of my clinicals where we did two and a half grams, the things that came out of me, talking. <laughs> Going on, I just look up at the, the, the doctor and I just looked over and I'm like, I hate my father. Whoa, where did that come from? But it led into something else. And, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just it's so good with all of it. Awesome talk, thank you. Allison. Well, personally, I'm a lone wolf. <laughs> and I've never had any therapies of any sorts or groups when I've consumed all of these substances. I've done most of the work on my own. And I find, literally, that learning in groups is much better, obviously, which is why I'm so happy to see a full house here today. But also, again, I can't thank Steve and, yes, yeah, Steve and uh, Scott enough, because they're heroes, because they're talking about this. Me, I've been in the media for decades talking about all drugs, so everybody would know that when they look at me, that I wouldn't be, it wouldn't frighten me to be in a group talking about substances like this. But again, I've never ever been able to have a journey where I've, you know, literally, other than all of you now, because I just did, again, I took five grams of mushrooms about 15 minutes ago, and all of you are beautiful, and this is a beautiful thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, like it's, I would, being in a group, I would say is extremely beneficial, but even just, sharing your story with another person that's had psychedelic experiences um, like just having those open conversations of what got brought to light and how you worked through certain things um, I was lucky enough last October was the last journey I did and it was with a group called Roots to Thrive out of uh, I think it's Vancouver or somewhere in BC that was at Victoria I believe. yeah and uh, that's ran by doctors and nurses that help people with uh, cancer diagnosis get access to the mushrooms and it was extremely beneficial because we did I think four or five weekly meetings every Wednesday before the session and then we did four or five um, weekly meetings after the journeys and I had had several experiences before that but all these people it was their probably their first time trying mushrooms um, if it wasn't it was their first time trying it to help them with end of life stress and just seeing the change in them after the journey um, is still something that makes me smile because you would every Wednesday we would go on there and we would be sharing our stories and people would be crying and angry and mad and, and after the journey everyone was just hopeful and grateful about life. So as we all know, cost is often a barrier, not just information or lack of general access, but once we do gain access, the cost is often quite insurmountable if these things are not covered. So how has that barrier uh, impacted you? And if you can just help uh, the crowd and everyone here understand uh, what steps you took to overcome those barriers, whether that's, you know, groups to thrive or individual work. It's an open question. I, I am a woman, so I will leave. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Co 
because for me it's always been an issue. That's why I'm always in the media. I need help. My prescription is a little more than most, and again, a little more than the average Canadian, but nobody should be out looking like I am on the street for their medicine. And that's the biggest thing. We need to teach the government that this is medicine and that nobody, again, should be I don't know, what, whatsoever stopped or hindered by it, uh, when those substances are legalized in the countries that they have free reign and they can charge whatever they want. And that, to me, is a serious problem. So legalizing and regulating these substances would be a start. Thank you, Allison. Scott? <laughs> Well, you know, ketamine assisted therapy, for example, is pretty expensive. Uh, well, I, th I think the average I'm seeing is about ten thousand dollars for ketamine. It's a lot. Um, and vac Veterans Affairs has now stopped with all psychedelic therapies. Uh, they started and then they stopped. Absolutely. If I hadn't had Veterans Affairs when they first did it, if I hadn't had them behind behind me on that, I would have never even considered it ever. Uh, with with the mushrooms, I just bit the bullet and said I don't care. It's, it's not like I spend a lot on it, but it's enough. But I just bit the bullet on it. And it's okay. And my my life is better than my wallet. I appreciate that. Let's see. Um, yeah, that's been a a huge issue for for me in my journey. Um, like again, even when I found this company out of Calgary, like you would see the price and like it would be like four thousand, five thousand dollars, and it's just like, yeah, I can't, I can't afford that. Like I have a young family to take care of and, and all of this, but like I'm just desperate for the help that I know that it will bring me, and that's what has led me to to do more underground journeys than I have been actually allowed to do the legal journeys. Um, thankfully, though, with the legal ones. Um, how it's still kind of new and happening in Ontario. Um, the doctors and everyone that has been part of my journeys have done it pretty much for free or at very less cost, uh, charge. Um, but still, even just just even paying for for therapy, um, it can get pricey, um, especially when you're disabled and on disability, and like I said, have a young family to take care of at the same time. You don't want to be going out for a weekend and spending three months worth of money on one therapy session, you kind of feel a little greedy at, like, to do that. Thank you. Um, we're gonna wrap up in just a couple minutes here. There are a lot of great questions that have come in on the app, so I appreciate, for all the prompting I did here, I really appreciate the wonderful questions. If, if we did not cover your question, we're gonna have about 15, 20 minutes after this before the next panel begins, or 20, 25 to 30 minutes. Um, so I please strongly encourage you to come up. Uh, we will be mixing and mingling. Please ask the questions you want to find answers to. Um, but just before we leave uh, and part ways for, for a little bit uh, before the next panel, um, any parting words that you want to share with, uh, with the audience here tonight? Just a quick uh, word from uh, Scott, perhaps. First of all, thank you uh, for being here, everyone. Thank you for having me. Everyone here. And Let's just fight this. Let's let's get it done. Let's get everyone let's get everyone normal again. Let's get let everyone live again. Please, my last words are support this charter challenge. Get out there and support it. And again, if you don't know about psilocybin and what it apparently it's safer than any other substance in the world. So wait, I shouldn't say apparently, I know these things. <laughs> But again, psilocybin is safer than cannabis and much less harmful in every way. And if cannabis is harmful, then I'm bad. <laughs> I just want you to know, please support the Art Charter Challenge. And again, thank you, David, Stephen, and as well as Scott. What a wonderful evening and good to see a podcast. Thank you. I would just say, uh, share these stories that you've heard here tonight with people you know that might not have as much of an open mind to psychedelics and their healing capabilities. And if there is ever a vote for this stuff, to make sure you get out and vote to support any way you can. And anyone that has any other questions for me, feel free to come up to me. I, I love talking and uh, 
more than happy to give you my contact info. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So I just received the good word that at 9 o'clock we will be reconvening for the next panel. I just want to say a big thank you to Scott, Allison, and Steve for sharing your stories, for sharing your experiences, the ups and downs. Stories are what catalyze communities. It's how ideas spread, how movements start, how conversations can be had, and how an evidence-informed framework, a compassionate framework for access, can really start taking hold. So the conversations that we're having here tonight, uh, I hope, I genuinely hope, that we can carry these forward into your respective communities, uh, and how we can all come together and form an informed way forward uh, that's a tongue twister. Uh, it's good, it's, it, it comes down to us. It comes down to us being active members of our community, uh, engaging and helping to educate people and educating ourselves first and foremost, following the evidence, following our hearts, and following where these stories can take us. So again, thank you very much for uh, from bottom of my heart, and I'm sure for everyone here tonight for sharing everything you have. Um, we have uh, with 25, uh, with 34, I'm not good at math, 38 minutes, 38 minutes uh, to reconvene for the next panel. Um, so thank you very much again. Please, uh, great questions, ask questions away afterwards, and enjoy this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care,